Online Events Marketplace, Event Finder, was started in 2006 and has seen steady and hefty growth of about 20% year on year. MBR's Calida Stewart Menteith spoke with founder James McGlynn. What made you decide to set up Event Finder? What gap in the market did you see? So at the time, before we started, there were a few events calendars online, but there was no one place anyone in the, con- in the country could go to find out what was happening. Um, you know, the city councils had their own websites. There were some interest groups that had their own websites. But it was really difficult, especially if you were travelling around. Uh, and so my business partner, Michael, actually came back from Australia and was catching up with friends and family around the country and realised that there was no way to find out exactly what was happening everywhere he was going. Uh, So he came to me at the time, I had another business, a web development firm, and he told me about this idea for this events calendar, a single events calendar for the whole country. Uh, And I thought that's absolutely amazing. I'd been in events as well uh, in a prior life as a DJ, and I thought this is absolutely fantastic. Uh, And so I sold my company, Nerds Inc., and uh, Michael and I spent the next couple of years on the kitchen table building Event Finder wasn't a ticketing company back then, it was just an event marketing company. Uh, but we engaged the industry, uh, so they loaded up all of their events and what was going on, and we very quickly built a big consumer audience. You were just 26 when you founded the company. Did you find that that made it hard for people to take you seriously? Uh, yes, it certainly did, yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd been in business since I was 17, so Uh, In in many ways, I'd been dealing with that for quite some time. Um, But it's it's not so bad when you're building a tech product because you're behind a laptop. Uh, Not everyone can see you and they don't all think that you look 12 years old. So that helps. Often founders are very emotionally connected to their business. Um, As a chief executive as well, how do you keep a cool head when you're making business decisions? I think it it can sometimes be difficult, um, but the key thing is to keep in mind the experience of the clients and the customers and make sure that what you're doing is going to serve them in the best way uh, and be consistent to the values that you've got in the culture as an organisation. So that's something that we're very big on. How important has it been to you to have mentors along the way? It's hugely important to have mentors. Um, I, I think I've been very fortunate enough to have mentors at pretty much every stage of my entrepreneurial journey, uh, including now. Um, in fact, we uh, appointed for the first time a, a board chair last year, uh, who's Sharon Hunter, and she's also been uh, a mentor to me through that period since. So it's, it's really helpful. It's also really helpful to surround yourself with people who have been through what you're going through uh, and have faced some of those challenges. Um, And that's where groups like the Entrepreneur uh, Organisation, EO, uh, are very, very helpful. Sharon Hunter's a big name in business. What's the best advice she's given you so far? Sharon's very, very good at the marketing side of things uh, and and, uh, looking at brand, which was a big deal for us last year. So we'd had a brand that we'd outgrown um, and it was really time for a refresh. And we found that the the values of the brand didn't any longer resonate with the values of the company and the clients that we were going out and talking to. So she was a really strong influence through that process, which was really great. Um, She also brings a lot of experience to the table. Uh, You know, her her history, having started PC Direct when she was 23 and and selling it at 29 as really, I think, New Zealand's largest uh, PC integrator at that stage, um, has been hugely beneficial for us. Do you ever disagree with the directors of the company? I think it's healthy to disagree from time to time around the the board table. Um, I think it's it's harder for a CEO um, or a managing director um, than it is for a a regular, for any other director um, when you go through those disagreements because you're the one who then has to go and execute the decision. Um, But it's that process that helps you come out with the robust Uh, direction and strategy that you need Uh, and our board have certainly been very valuable in that respect. So building up this business obviously isn't always easy. What sort of roadblocks have you hit over the last few years? So probably one of the biggest challenges in ticketing is that it's it's quite a complex business model. Um, Where we used to be a marketing company and we saw an opportunity in ticketing 
we really thought that it was, again, going to be a consumer-focused effort um, because that's what our, our marketing business was. The Event Finder Marketplace was very much focused on the consumer and, and the promoter. What we realised in ticketing is that there are other stakeholders, uh, and venues in particular, have a very strong say in the process. Often they're, they're the, the deciding factor in which ticketing company is used for events. And that is not always the, the most progressive, uh, forward-looking, digitally enabled um, sector. So that has been one of our biggest challenges, has been winning over the, the venue operators um, who have used the incumbent ticketing companies, the big international firms, for sometimes decades. And so being the new player on the block can be quite challenging from time to time. How do you find dealing with competition in the market? There is a lot of competition. Um, it's it's tough, um, but they make us better. You know that we really have to sharpen our efforts if we want to go up against the international beer moths like Ticketmaster, you know, part of the Live Nation group, They're the largest entertainment conglomerate in the world. The hundreds of developers. We're we're a, a small team, uh, mostly down here in New Zealand, with again a very small development team. But it's the focus on the consumer and making sure that we're doing what's right for them and balancing their needs with the needs of the other industry stakeholders, the promoters and the venues, um, which I think sets us apart. And that really comes from our DNA as a, a consumer-focused marketing company. Uh, and thinking as we got into this space, hey, let's build something that the industry would build if they had the resources to do it themselves. And I think that's a very different approach to that of most of our competition. Event Finder is quite well known in New Zealand, but you launched into Australia about 18 months ago. Does it sort of feel like you're back to being a startup again there? It absolutely feels like being a startup again. It's really incredible. It's both invigorating and exhausting, uh, but it's, it's a lot of fun. We're very passionate about it. What we found in New Zealand, especially at the point we're at now, where everyone really knows who we are, we are a generalist. And we do ticketing and we advertise events right through the spectrum from the small country fairs and, and school fundraisers all the way up to arena concerts and stadium sports. And what we found going into Australia was that that wasn't a great business model. Um, you know, when you start a business, you really need to understand who your audience is and focus on a niche and, and execute exceptionally well for them. And we found that we had to go through that process again in Australia. We had to identify what was the market niche uh, that we would target and make sure that we were very, very good at it. In New Zealand, it's quite a small market as well. There's a number of competitors and many are generalists like us. Uh, but over in Australia, almost every niche has a specialist of some description uh, who is already meeting those needs. So we had to go back to the product team and say, OK, how do we design something that works exceptionally well for this uh, group, this target market? Um, so much so that they would go with us over the competition and then talk to all of their friends and, and associates uh, and make sure that the word spread. Uh, and so we did that. Uh, it took us a little while to get that product market fit over there. Um, but now it's going very well. What's your niche in Australia? So we're really focused on the arts sector. It's arts venues, arts festivals, film festivals and those sorts of events. So for example at the moment uh, the big event that we've got on over there is the Virgin Australia Melbourne Fashion Festival uh, and there's a number of other arts focused events that are, are in play at the moment. Can you take these lessons that you've learned in Australia and apply them to other overseas markets? We certainly hope to in future but we're very wary of spreading ourselves too thin. Uh, so right now we have all of our attention focused on the, the New Zealand market and continuing to evolve and build our platform for Australia. Once we're comfortable that we've done that, and, and right now we're, we're in Melbourne, but there's, the rest of the market over there is huge. Uh, so that we could easily move from Melbourne to Sydney to Perth. Uh, and I think once we've done that successfully and we're comfortable with it, that'll be the time for us to go further afield. And Singapore will probably be the next place to go. And have you found it very hard to attract funding over the years? I think we've, we've certainly attracted funding over the years. Um, very early on, when it was just Michael and I, we realised that we were going to need a little bit more uh, resources to be able to achieve what we wanted to. And so we, we were very fortunate to engage APN, now NZME, and they came on board. Um, 
But unfortunately, their business model changed, as everyone knows, through the GFC. Uh, and uh, it, it became apparent before too long that that wasn't going to be a relationship that we would continue with uh, indefinitely. Uh, and they exited uh, a couple of years later. But along the way, we have found other investors who've shared our passion for this space and, and the digital space. Um, and we've been very fortunate to bring on board the likes of Evander Management, um, the majority owners of Datacom, who also have a, a portfolio of other digital ventures. Um, and also Mark Dalgleish in Australia, a, a digital entrepreneur who has a lot of experience that he also brings to our board. So we've been very lucky in the people that we've been able to surround ourselves with along the way. And would you say you're in a sort of sweet spot with funding at the moment, especially with your revenue growing so fast? We are, are in a, a really uh, good place for us at the moment where we're funded out of uh, our earnings. And we've taken the approach for the time being uh, that rather than look for uh, the hockey stick growth that comes with traditional venture capital funding, that we would continue to grow reasonably steadily um, and make sure that we can scale effectively, bring on the people that we need, maintain our culture, uh, and maintain our, our um, focus on the, making sure that the product is absolutely right for our market along the way. So what's your vision for the business? I mean, how big do you want it to grow? We would like to be the number one independent ticketing company across New Zealand and Australia within the next few years. And that's a, a big undertaking. Uh, there are a lot of competitors over in the market in Australia. Um, and when I say independent, the big vertically integrated international firms like Ticketmaster and Ticketek, uh, I don't include in that. Um, it becomes very difficult to compete with uh, the companies that have huge touring arms and venue portfolios. Um, but as, as far as the independent ticketing companies go, I think we're very close to that, if not already there in New Zealand, but we have a, a big challenge ahead of us in Australia. And as, as the founder, as chief executive, how big a toll does this take on your personal life to be focusing so much on this business? I think that's all relative. Um, you know, the idea of, of work-life balance. Um, I absolutely love what I do. I, I say almost every day I, I'd be doing this whether I was being paid or not. Um, I, I love the industry. I love the product that we've built. I'm a techie at heart, so I absolutely love the digital side of it uh, that we've built. Um, I think when you love what you do, it doesn't really matter if you're still up at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night uh, working on it. But it is really important to find that balance. Um, thankfully, I have a very understanding wife, Casey. We were married a year ago, just over a year ago. Um, and it, it certainly helps to have that family support around you, uh, when it's, especially when the going gets tough, and to have a great team who are very supportive as well. Any thoughts of an exit, whether that's through a public market listing or a trade sale? Yes, I think we're always open to that. It's something that from time to time we think about and consider whether the timing's right. Um, and when it is, and, and when there are, say if it was a trade sale, we would, we would need to find someone out there who shared our passion for the industry and thought about things the way that we do. Um, or if it's a public market listing, uh, a time when we can really invest uh, the time and energy that goes into that process, which is, is huge. Uh, so right now we're very, very focused on the product uh, and building our space in the market especially over in Australia, and that takes all of our time and energy. How many years might it be before you do uh, look at the exit properly? It's hard to say. You know, opportunities come along all the time, and if the right opportunity came along, we would absolutely stop and give it some serious consideration. James McGlynn, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks, Khaled. I appreciate it.